Now, the book of Deuteronomy in Hebrew is Devarim. Devarim, it literally means words, words plural. So, Devar is word, Devarim is words. That's the book of Deuteronomy in Hebrew. So, what's taking place here in Deuteronomy chapter 30 is towards the end of Moses' life. And he's about to hand over to his successor, Joshua. And he's preparing this generation of Israelites to enter the promised land. So there's 14 verses for the blessings and 53 verses for the curses. I think that that really says quite a lot, doesn't it? That there's 14 verses there dedicated to the blessings that Israel will come under. And 53 verses for the curses that they'll come under should they disobey God. So one of the curses that it describes here in Deuteronomy 28 is that God will scatter them from the land of Israel amongst the pagan nations. That is one of the curses and judgments that God will bring upon Israel if they turn from his commandments, that he will scatter them amongst the nations. Then in chapter 29, Moses reminds the people of how God sustained Israel for 40 years in the wilderness, and the covenant is renewed in chapter 29. But here in chapter 30... We see many of the prophecies, this is one of many of the prophecies in which God promises to always bring his people back. He says he will scatter them amongst the nations, but here in chapter 30 we see the first of God's promises to always bring Israel back to their homeland. This is what we see in Deuteronomy chapter 30. So the Jews return back to Jerusalem under Zerubbabel, under Jeshua and ultimately Ezra and Nehemiah. This is when the books of Ezra and Nehemiah take place. And the prophets who prophesied during this time would have been Haggai and Zechariah. These are books that take place at the return, when they return to Jerusalem after the 70-year captivity. And of course, it's after this point that God begins to prepare the Israelites for the coming of the Messiah. Of course, the Messiah is due to arrive on the scene very soon at this point. So God is now going to start preparing the Israelites for the Messiah to arrive. But it says, of course, in Isaiah 53 verse 3, that he was despised and rejected by men. He was rejected as the Messiah. And it also says that in John chapter 1, verse 11, that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. So the own people there being the Jews. He came to his own people, the Jews, and his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believed in his name. Now, because the Jewish people rejected the gospel, because they rejected their own Messiah, this is when God gave the Gentiles the non-Jews, the opportunity to be saved in the same manner, to be saved by faith in the Jewish Messiah. So the gospel then went to the Gentiles. And again, we see a transition period there of the gospel going from Israel to the Gentiles. We see, for example, in Acts chapter 10, that Cornelius was the first Gentile to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Three times in the book of Acts, Paul says, I'm done with you lot, I'm going to the Gentiles now. We see that three times in the book of Acts. So there's a transition period there where the gospel goes from Israel to the Gentile nations. This is all alluded to in the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22. You know the parable of the, the king who had a wedding for his son and he said to the servants, go and invite everybody, uh, sorry, go and tell everybody who's invited that the wedding feast is ready. So that's the Jewish people. And they said, we don't want to come. We're busy. We're too busy to come. They made excuses. So the king, in his anger, said, go and burn their city, and now go out into the highways and byways and invite everybody who you see, because he wanted the wedding hall to be full. That's a picture of the gospel going from those who were invited, the Jews, to those who weren't invited, the Gentiles. Go out into the highways and byways and invite everybody who you see. That's a picture of the gospel being taken from the Jewish people and being given to the Gentiles. So because the Jews rejected their own Messiah, God has now given the Gentiles the, opposition, the opportunity to be saved by faith through grace. Now remember though, Jeremiah 31 said, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. What that means is, is that Gentiles who believe in the Jewish Messiah are basically grafted in to this covenant. There's more about this in Romans 11, which we'll touch on very shortly. But Romans 11 tells us that non-Jews who believe in the Jewish Messiah and who love the God of Israel are grafted in to that olive tree. Galatians chapter 3 tells us that 
the non-Jews who believe in the Jewish Messiah become spiritual descendants of Abraham. So God is not interested in bloodline necessarily. He's not interested in who is a bloodline Jew. He's interested in those who have faith. He's interested in those who believe in the Jewish Messiah. That, in God's eyes, is who is a true Jew, the ones who believe in the Jewish Messiah, regardless of bloodline. If you believe in the Jewish Messiah, you are a spiritual descendant of Abraham. Amen. So ever since the nation of Israel disappeared, and because the gospel went to the Gentiles, this is how this idea came about, that God has permanently turned his back on Israel. This idea known as replacement theology, the idea that God is done with Israel, he's finished with the Jewish people, and that now the Gentiles are the chosen people. This is how this idea came about, because the Jewish people rejected their own Messiah, and that now the gospel was gone to the Gentiles. This is how the idea of replacement theology came about. In other words, the Gentile church has now replaced Israel. Now, it is an idea that originated with kind of people like Augustine of Hippo and Constantine and things like this. It was pretty much a Catholic doctrine that you saw throughout the Catholic Church, and then it was popularized by reformers such as Martin Luther. These guys were notorious anti-Semites, very much against Israel, very much against the Jewish people. So it's people like this who popularized this, this uh, theory of replacement theology. Now, the thing is with replacement theology, it's an idea which is not found anywhere in the scriptures. It is not a scriptural idea. It is purely an invention of the church. It is purely an invention to say, we are now the chosen people and God is finished with Israel. He's done with the Jewish people now and the Gentile church has replaced Israel. That is what replacement theology is. It is an invention of the church. It is not found anywhere in the scriptures. Because the Bible tells us that there's multiple promises and blessings concerning Israel. But the replacement theology clan say that because Israel didn't exist anymore, because Israel was destroyed as a nation, that those promises and blessings are now transferred to the Christian church. The Christian church are now the ones who are beneficiaries of the uh, promises and blessings concerning Israel.